Hi, I'm Ian McDonald, Western Region Sales Training Manager for Allstream. I'm here with Mike Schoenberger, who's a Strategic Account Manager in Edmonton. SIP trunking with Allstream is proving to be an effective differentiator for us, especially in the mid-market where the offering is enabling our customers to accelerate the pace of their business. Uh, Mike's had some uh, tremendous success here in his territory in terms of positioning SIP trunking with his customers and, in fact, hitting the Allstream home run. So, Mike, before we uh, get into the conversation too much today, perhaps you can tell us what the Allstream home run is all about. Sure. Thanks, Ian. So, uh, so the Allstream home run is, uh, is something that we've, uh, we came up with in the Edmonton office here, Rob and I. Uh, describes selling multiple products and services. So any combination of four or more services, three bases, and the fourth makes the home run. So whether it be, uh, you know, typically the one that I've been the most successful with is uh, UC, SIP trunking, MPLS, and Secure Connect. Um, but you could roll in security services or a multitude of other things into there as well. All right, so now that we know a little bit more about what the Allstream home run is, maybe we should find out a little bit more about you. Uh, can you tell us something about your background? Uh, how long have you been with the company? Where were you before you started with Allstream? Sure, so I'll, uh, I'll start off with uh, where I was before Allstream. So uh, that was back in 1987, and uh, previously to that I was in high school. So uh, right out of high school, I uh, joined uh, the equipment side of the business. Uh, it was CTG at the time, and uh, decided that I really liked it, to doing the technical installation. Went to technical college for a couple of years, uh, and then uh, was a technician for 16 years, the last eight of which I, I migrated over to sales. And I've, uh, I've been on the uh, dark side of the force ever since. All right, then. So how many SIP trunking deals have you actually closed? So I have closed uh, eight deals uh, myself, and I've been involved in nine, uh, one of which was migrated uh, partway through the installation to myself. Uh, an interesting story here and when you know we're talking SIP trunking or IP trunking and it was first uh, introduced by Allstream which is you know first in our industry which is you know another positive feature and feather in our cap. Um, there's training in Calgary and uh, I was bused down to Calgary went to this training session and you know as soon as I heard about it I, I'm kind of a techno guy as you can see with my iPad and I thought wow this is great this is awesome you know something else to, to sell and, and leverage more business and um, and then they started going through the whole training process and saying you need customers that have four or five PRIs and right. and and it you know it's kind of a little let down because in my field here I don't have very many clients like that um, so it wasn't until two or two years later that uh, that Rob uh, Rob brought it to my attention that uh, they now have compression and 729 and we can do more with less and it's now something that's we can actually start positioning because it uh, it fits to a lot more customers so um, then I really got it started to get excited about it and we started positioning it and hence all these deals started so uh, that's great so l let me ask you this what kind of revenue uh, in in total, would you be looking at for the eight accounts that you managed to close? So 50, 52816 so 53 grand a month in MRR, and about $1.9 million in TCV. Wow. So, I mean, that's pretty good. We're talking nearly $6,000, roughly $6,000 per uh, opportunity. Um, I have to ask you, though, uh, you positioned a lot of these. What kind of uh, close percentage are you looking at when you position SIP trunking? It, uh, I, in my opinion, the, the more products and services you position at once, the higher the percentages go up. So if you do the all-stream home run, uh, typically when you get to the point of closing, you're 95%. You know, it's over 90%. It's very high. Well, that's fantastic. So um, maybe we should start off with some of the basics. I mean, SIP trunking is a relatively new offering, and so for those who aren't that familiar with it, could you uh, give us a bit of an overview of uh, what SIP trunking is and what it does? Sure, absolutely. So I, when I discuss and describe SIP trunking, um, I usually bring it up the fact that it's like a PRI replacement. It's, uh, you know, PRI on steroids, basically. So when, when you're describing PRI, everybody knows what it is. You pick the number of channels or conversations that you want to have, right. and then you pick the number of DIDs you want. Well, SIP trunking works in the same manner. You pick the number of DTEs, which is digital trunk equivalents, uh, and, then, and then you choose your DIDs, just like you would a PRI. 
where the, where the steroids part comes in is a couple different things. You have uh, virtual presence ability. So, you know, what I mean by that is I'm an Edmonton head office and I want to have a presence in Toronto, in Calgary, in, in uh, Vancouver, Saskatoon, Regina, all of these places. I no longer have a need to get a connectivity in that office and bring it over my network. Everything can all hone in on one office. So I can get that dial tone from any of those offices in one office. That's a very big thing. Um, the other thing is the failover options that you get on SIP trunking versus PRI. So with, with SIP trunking, um, or with PRI rather, you have to do a temporary local redirect or a um, PRI failover in order to transfer your main number to your alternate source in a state of emergency. Whereas with SIP trunking, it happens automatically. Uh, all, not just your main number, but all the DIDs that are associated with that can fail over, and they can fail over to some of the other great things that we're going to talk about, you know, farther on. Okay. So, how do you deal with uh, normal PSTN services like 911, for example? So, when uh, SIP trunking, the way that Allstream has, has handled that is uh, they have live answer contact center. So that when somebody dials 911, uh, it goes to live answer and then they direct it to the to the appropriate PSAP. Um, as well, there's lots of different things that we can do. We, you know, there's gateways that can be put in if you want to put a local line. Um, 911 is no longer an issue. Okay, that's great. Okay, so a little bit more on the definition side before we talk about how you go about actually selling the service. Uh, you know, we hear a lot of acronyms bandied around. So we hear people talk about SIP trunking. IP trunking, IP telephony. Um, can you tell us what the difference is? Yeah, absolutely. Actually, one one thing on the last thing that I forgot to mention sure. was the uh, QoS. And, okay. and when we're talking about what you just mentioned now, people get a little bit leery of SIP trunking. So, you know, the fact that we do QoS in our networks is a big plus as well. Um, so the IP telephony and SIP trunking. So. IP, I'm going to talk about SIP trunking first. Okay. It's also referred to as IP trunking. Um, and what it is, is it's the trunk side. So when you're talking on your phone, the dial tone, that conversation path, that's what IP trunking or SIP trunking is. Okay. is it's, it's the method to getting your voice out there. Um, IP trunking is the endpoint. It's the device on the desk. It's your, the application on your cell phone, um, application on your PC. IP trunking is anything to do on the station or the equipment side. So basically customer premise equipment. So IP trunking is kind of the telco side. Um, IP telephony is the customer side. Okay, great. That clears that up for us. All right. So what are some of the immediate benefits that a customer would experience when they implement this technology? Sure. So, you know, as we alluded to above, virtual presence is a big one, right? The ability to, you know, open up an office in a new region and you can test the waters and create a phone number so you have that local presence before you actually physically go out and open that office. Uh, call centers can use it where you know they want to have a, a local Toronto presence you know and anytime a call center calls you with a 1-800 number um, people don't answer it right so if you're a call center and you have a local phone number that's displayed you can do that with SIP trunking without having to put equipment in that region. Um, very flexible business models. So if I'm, a, again, the example of a call center and I'm seasonal, so you know one time a year I have to go and order a whole bunch of lines and there's contract or I have to pay more because it's short term, um, with SIP trunking you can basically turn the volume up or turn the volume down. So when you need more channels, the bandwidth is increased, you add more channels. When you don't need them, you can take them away. So that's, there's flexibility of the service. That's great. So. How long does it take a customer when they want to allocate that additional bandwidth and number of DTEs? So it's just basically putting in a service request under under two weeks for sure. In a lot of cases, it can be under a week, especially if they're managed services. It can be pretty quick. Okay. You know, there's the obvious benefits of it of of co potential cost savings, right? Um, the disaster recovery uh, ability, uh, you know, redundancy that I talked about that failover, and uh, you know, that single office feel. So a lot of times, uh, you know, it's another method, just like MPLS is, it takes away the distance. So if you have offices throughout the company or throughout the country, uh, you can take that away that distance and appear as one to your customers. Okay. 
Now, Edmonton isn't really known as a hotbed of head offices or multi-branch locations. So uh, a question I have for you is when you're looking at opportunities, are th is there a minimum number of uh, locations that a customer would have to have before you would entertain speaking with them about the service? Yeah, you, you definitely don't want to make assumptions. Uh, there's no minimum. Um, other than the fact that you want to make sure they're a valid opportunity, right? You want to qualify it. If you have a, you know, a car dealership that or a little mom and pop auto repair shop that has two phones, they're probably not a candidate for IP trunking, but or SIP trunking. But if it, you know, if it's a bigger organization that you know as mid market reps we're trying to target, 50 people and multiple sites, um, definitely a candidate. If they're a single office that has a you know a call center, definitely a candidate. Um, you know, that's my, the thing that I personally do is if they have more than two sites um, or if they have that high volume call requirement. So access is obviously uh, important consideration in this. I understand that SIP trunking is now available over the internet. So what uh, opportunities does that present for Allstream? Yeah, that's, that's huge. Um, as everybody knows or maybe doesn't know, uh, there's our competitors sell it as well, right? So TELUS and Bell and Shaw are now have the ability to sell it. Um, right. The fact we've been doing it for five years adds cred credibility. The fact that we can now do it over the internet adds even more credibility to us and more differentiation to us. So, you know, there's two different flavors to that. There's, you know, over our own internet or bring your own internet. Um, the, having the, the, the ability to have SIP trunking over the internet is an amazing failover option. So we provide them an MPLS solution and in the event of a disaster situation, something happens to that MPLS, boom, automatically all calls, all phone numbers are rerouted to the internet access and back to that customer's equipment and handled seamlessly. Right. Uh, so that's, you know, that's a big thing. So presumably there's advantages if you have your uh, internet connection with Allstream as opposed to bringing your own internet. Can you elaborate on that a little bit more? Yeah, absolutely. So one of the big advantages, and it's rolling out the beginning of next year, is that Allstream has the ability, as I mentioned, QoS is important. Um, they have the ability to provide QoS on the bring uh, on the Allstream internet. Oh, okay. On the bring your own internet, there's there's no quality of service, and the reason why I wouldn't position it personally that way as a primary source of trunking, is um, VoIP already has a bit of a bad name in the industry, right. voice over internet protocol, and there's been companies that have have tried it over the last five six years and failed and. One perfect example of that is Shift Networks. So even though they're still kind of niggling around a little bit, they've changed their business model to be able to enable Q QoS. Um, they provided all these great features and functionality, but they did it over the internet, and they didn't have the ability to control it. Nobody can control the internet. Uh, and so it gave, uh, you know, it made it harder for us in the industry. And, uh, and by us doing QoS over our own internet, and some people are probably thinking, well, how the heck do we do that? And uh, I don't understand all the nuts and bolts of it, but basically what I've been told is because it's on our network, we have control over how traffic facilitates through our network. So we have the ability to control that through a secure SIP or a protocol like that that can ensure that that traffic gets from point A to point B on our network properly. Okay, that's good. Um, you know, besides the obvious advantage of retiring IPC quota and earning commissions, what is it that has you so enthusiastic about selling IP trunking? It's, uh, it's, it's the main thing is that, you know, when you look at SIP trunking on its own, you know, at $10 a channel, it's not going to retire a quota. Um, the big thing is it's a wedge. It's a differentiator. And as I alluded to before, you know, our competitors have it now. Um, they're afraid of it because of the revenue that they can lose and the fact that they don't know it and they haven't been doing it as long as us. So it's, it's definitely a wedge into that Allstream home run, into getting other services that can bring more revenue to us, to the, to the MPLS, to the Secure Connect, to the UC, to the security, to these other things. And, and, and you know, we need to differentiate ourselves and get the customers looking away from Bell and Telus and looking to us as, as their trusted advisor and trusted partner. And SIP trunking for me has, has been one of those big differentiators. Okay, when you mention the incumbents, uh, it's an interesting area. Are they talking with their customers about SIP trunking? No, absolutely not. 
and I find you know customers themselves aren't going to be talking to us about it because it's not really that widely known. It's becoming more and more popular, and will continue to be that way. But the reason why the competitors aren't talking about it is, as I alluded to, they don't understand it. They're new to it. They, you know, as an early adopter of it, I went through a tremendous amount of pain. I sold the first sip trunking on the first Panasonic, on the first Mitel, and you know, I can't say it was pain free, but you know, like anything, pain gives you an opportunity for learning. And, uh, and we learned a lot. I learned a lot personally. And I think it, as an organization through, you know, these, these installs and other installs, we learned a lot. So, uh, you know, we're definitely positioned to, to win in it now. That's great. Well, look, I'm going to ask you to maybe uh, swing over to the fancy looking chart that you brought for us tonight and, and talk a little bit about uh, when you're looking at newer existing customers, um, the kinds of uh, characteristics that you would look for that might signal a really good opportunity for IP trunking. So sort of the legacy network to what we'd like to see them do. Sure, absolutely. So, so basically what, what I've done is, you know, I try to describe to the customer, you know, where they are today and how complicated it is and uh, and where we'd like to get them to go. And while looking at, at these drawings here, but they both look pretty complicated, um, I'll explain what you know how I say it's simpler. So when we look at this, we've got three sites. They all have UC phone systems, which is you know unified communication systems. They all have firewalls. This particular case is is an internet-based VPN solution. So they each have to have connections to the PSTN, which is for their trunking or their phone lines. So that's what this one line is into each site. And then they have to have their internet connections that they use to, to do their firewall. And you can add extra things here that they might have backup interconnect connections or all kinds of other things. Um, reason why I've identified the firewalls here is these are all potential security risks as well. And I'll allude to that a little bit further later. Um, so now when we go up to our simplified or our SIP uh, connection, we've got our three sites again. And if you notice, there's only one connection from every site into the MPLS. So all these, this is my telephone and this is my PC, just like in this situation. And there's no longer a, a UC box here. There's no longer a UC box there. There's what they say VM, which is like a virtual machine. Now there's many different ways we can do this. I'm just talking like an optimal one. So this is a virtual machine, and we have phones that work off of that. So if this is Toronto, Edmonton, Vancouver, or better yet, let's go Edmonton head office, Toronto, and Vancouver for the other ones. Um, we don't need any hardware here. We can just simply have phones sitting off the MPLS network. Um, a call comes in. It just routes to the main controller in Edmonton, and it's for Calgary here. It just routes to the phone. In a failover situation, we lose this. All those calls automatically route through the through the internet back to our disaster recovery situation. So, you know, all these extra add-ons that I talk about. This is our our SIP trunking gateway here, which is a bolt-on to the MPLS. This is a secure connect, which is our internet gateway. It's a bolt-on to the MPLS. So, you know, rather than having all these potential holes in their network. In this diagram, the only hole is a secure connect gateway, which is uh, a carrier grade managed firewall. So it's extremely secure. So the size of the organization, the number of offices they have, hopefully in large centers, these would be the kinds of things you'd be looking for. Yeah, absolutely. Now, we talked earlier about a customer of yours, uh, Creative Doors, that was actually a competitive win. I wonder if you could give us a bit of a lowdown on what happened with that customer. Sure. So Creative Door was uh, a UC account, and uh, they were a UC customer of ours for, let's say, the past five, six years. Right. And, you know, over that time, as always, you know, I've been trying to get their network, and they were always in a TELUS contract and said, you know, our network's fine, we like you looking after our UC. Uh, and then they had an impending event. They were moving. Um, so they thought, you know what, we're moving, we should explore this stuff. And I berated him enough, telling him how great we are and the stuff we do, that he goes, okay, I want to hear what you guys have to say. So we started having our conversations and, and going through these sorts of diagrams and, and conversations and uncovering some of the things that they were looking at doing internally. And with the positioning of the SIP trunking, the, uh, the Secure Connect firewall, a UC upgrade to their, phone, to their Mitel phone system, uh, he just he really liked our total offering 
and we, you know, he said we had a complete solution. And um, so he actually, so much so that he agreed to pay a $30,000 penalty to tell us in order to go with us, wow. right? So you know when you know, when the customer said does that, that's a great a great sign. And you know I asked him after we won the business, um, what was your you know what was your key reason why you chose Allstream? And you know his answer was the completeness of your solution. So it wasn't just a financial decision for them. No, it was the ability of all the different things that we can do. Oh, that's great. So. All right, let's let's get down to the secret sauce a little bit. I mean, everybody wants to know what it is that you talk uh, to customers about. In our QBS training, we've talked about the importance of creating curiosity in the in the mind of a potential customer. So, how is it that you get the door open to you to start to talk about these opportunities? Uh, so, there's there's multiple different ways of doing it. Uh, one of the ones is uh, one of the ones I actually use a lot, especially if it's a new opportunity is I, I first of all ask how often um, they have a telecom audit done or when was the last time they had a telecom audit done. Right. And, and what I mean from that is, you know, getting a copy of their phone bills, um, network invoice, and actually looking at them and identifying um, things that are, are not required or maybe they're paying too much for. And in 99% of the, the opportunities or customers that I've done this with, there's almost always lines or things they're not using. Wow. Um, one great example is a, there was a cement company that, that I look after and they, they were spending a hundred and some thousand dollars a month and there was close to thirty thousand dollars in waste in their phone bills. Now they gave me a box about this big that I had to you know surf through but right. uh, but they were paying for data circuits in sites that had closed five years ago. Right. And you know you know the value that that brings to the customer and you go hey this is what I've un uncovered is great that gives you credibility and differentiates you and second of all it provides you insight into what they're currently spending which gives you a much better idea on how you can position the services that we provide right and you can actually do actual ROI tools with actual numbers all right so the financial side of things uh, can be a little bit tough these days, companies looking for money to do things, but you can actually find some of the money in their current expenditures to use uh, to spend on the solution. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, another way that customers don't always think about it, especially when you're talking multiple offices, is by unifying their communication solution right. and bringing the offices together. You're getting rid of that distance. Maybe they have redundant positions or they're trying to find a receptionist and can't in another office where it could be handled by the head office or they have an administration and they can move bodies around and sometimes save bodies and be able to take that, you know, three, four thousand dollars a month from that body that they no longer require and again reinvest that into the into the network and into the solution or technology. You know, um, another uh, another interesting uh, interesting thing that I that I do is try to bring up like the elephant in the room. So I acknowledge that as an industry, um, the telecom industry as a whole is horrible at customer service. We suck at customer service. Right. It's a well-known fact and customers really just accept it. Yeah. And, and it's a mandate of our president, Dean Prevo, as everybody knows, that we want to change that. We, we no longer want to, we want to, no longer want to suck. We want to be an industry leader in that. And we want to give everybody a, a great customer experience. Uh, and we're working towards that. So, so how do customers react to that? Yeah, they always agree. And, oh, and okay. you know, they, I've never had anybody not agree with that. Right. Um, but they also, they agree and then say, it's nice to see that you guys recognize that, that you suck or that the industry sucks and that you're wanting to do something about it. Right. You know, and they understand that change doesn't happen overnight. They try to institute change in their own organizations that it takes time. Um, but it is something that, that uh, definitely breaks the ice for sure. Okay. Um, you'd also mentioned that you had a great opportunity with uh, a travel agency that you'd been able to work with by really kind of digging into some of the business problems after you spent some time on the phone bills and, and uh, exposing the elephant in the room. Can you share a little bit with us about that experience? Yeah, sure, absolutely. That that's kind of ties into the fact that try to find um, that we're providing highways and byways and the technology is really the driver that gets the customers excited about getting our highways and byways. 
So this this particular example is with a travel agent that you know they do wedding planning, they do event planning, they do all these sorts of things. Yeah. And while they're not quite there yet, they bought into the vision of it. Of what they want to do is a couple that's getting married comes in sees the, the travel agent or the wedding planner and they start talking about their wedding and they want to do it at a vacation resort somewhere. And the wedding planner goes, okay, well, let me just call my contact at this resort and they pull out a, an iPad or a playbook or a phone with a video device on it and they start walking around the resort. And they go, this is where your reception's going to be and this is where, you know, you the bride would be positioned in this area and you see the beach and the water coming up behind mm -hmm. and this is, you know, if we have a little bit of rain, this is the beautiful boardroom you'd be in and these are, this is the honeymoon suite and, you know, as a couple walking into that travel agency, do you think that they're going to go anywhere else? Well, it's not just a virtual tour. It's a guided virtual tour guided, just for them. So yeah. that's got to be pretty powerful. Yeah. Yeah. So things like that where you can find a business need that they say that this is a problem that they have and try to figure the technology into how it can potentially assist. Okay. So uh, when you're in the door and, and uh, starting to work on the opportunities, obviously it's important to you know, get to the decision maker. Um, but there are a lot of people involved in these decisions and typically the C-level executive is going to have a different agenda than the IT people may have. So how do you decide who to talk to and when to bring them into the conversation? So that's, that's a, very good, a very good point and you know I think it's, it's important to get in as, as many levels as you can. Mm -hmm. Uh, we need to get in at the IT level and have conversations that are technical on the nuts and bolts and firewalls and all those crazy things. And on the C level, it's more of the business process issues and and um, things that are relative to the actual business. The uh, an interesting story there is an organization that I've been working on for a long time, and I've actually been at the C level at the executive level, and I've got all their buy-in and all the administrative assistance that they have working on the projects and gathering information. Right. They say, "Oh, your MPLS, your SIP trunking, it's all awesome," and uh, we had uh, we got them to agree to do a presentation, a joint presentation to the executive, to a, a higher level of executive, the top executives, the board basically on why they should go forward with the solution. And they brought forward a few key things uh, that as an organization they were trying to do. They were trying to do a C new CRM tool. Um, they had a problem with um, trader turnover, so employee turnover. And they had a problem with, um, they wanted to do an online portal, right? So a secure online portal so people could do trades online, right. their financial trading organization. So we brought the IP, I, IT manager, and while I'd met with him a few times before, um, brought him into the conversation and he starts going, well, I don't know why, you know, you guys are, you know, talking about this while I see value in, in going with this beautiful clean model that I talked about previously, the SIP trunking. Um, we don't really need it. I've got this 50 meg down, these Shaw internet connections. It's all working great. It's secure. It's, you know, it's, it's doing all, everything we need it to do. Uh, and then I brought it back and I said, well, you know, as you know, your executives want to do these initiatives and, you know, went through the initiatives once, one by one. And I said, you know, the CRM tool, um, we did it in our organization and we didn't do it properly. And, uh, and it, it was slow. And as a sales rep, I, I hate to use it because it, it, it doesn't work the way that, that we want it to work. And now that they fixed it and, you know, it's getting a lot better, it's taken people a lot longer to adopt it as much as if it would have been great and streamlined and fast right off the get, right right off the gate. And so once I started, you know, and I can talk about the other stuff too, but once I started relating that the priorities of the executive um, and how it affected if he didn't do what he needed to do properly, he started the light bulb kind of came on and he started to think, okay, yeah, okay, we can do this in the presentation and he started to come on board. So yeah. you don't always get, you got to know who your champions are, who influences the decision, and, and like anything, it's important to get in at as many levels of the account as possible. So I, I think what you're saying is that you can't have the business discussion and the technology discussion in isolation from each other. They really have to be held together uh, in order to meet the business needs of the company with the right technology. Absolutely. Yeah. You need to have a clear understanding of both. Okay, so in getting there, we've also spent a lot of time, I'll go back to our QBS training now and talk a little bit about some of the questioning strategies and techniques that, uh, that you use to get to that information with both the IT uh, uh, technology group and with the business leaders. 
Um, what are some of the techniques that you've employed along the way to get the information you need to both increase their curiosity and, and establish your credibility in building a solution? So, you know, giving um, an understanding of, of the knowledge of their, of their organization very briefly, um, asking a series of questions that, uh, you know, diagnostic style of questions that, that gets them to give us information. Right. Um, you know, some of the questions would be, do you have competing events, you know, impending events, uh, like opening a new office, are you moving, expanding, are you looking to add workers? Um, anytime you get a diagnostic, you know, you ask that sort of question, that diagnostic question, and you get a response and that triggers other questions, it allows you to delve deeper. It allows you to get get more to the root of where the actual meat is, the, the information that you really want to, when, right. when they start sharing those those business problems or those impending events with you, then you know that you're kind of hitting the pay dirt and you want to keep that conversation going. So a lot of the issues that we hear about are pretty standard, vanilla flavored, you know, we like reliability, we want productivity, we want to increase our profitability and so on. Um, in terms of uh, working those into uh, more implications to the business of those issues, I know you had a, an interesting experience with the bank in trying to make sure they got maximum benefit from every customer that walked through the door. Can you uh, tell us a little bit about that opportunity? Yeah, sure, I'd love to. So, you know, when it talks to, like you said, the reliability, you want to find out, you know, why is reliability important to you? So it's not just reliability in their vision may be completely different than what it is in yours. So in this example of this bank, the, the problem that they had, and they, they went out and they did a, a questioning form with a lot of their staff, you know, because they, they want that personal touch and that, because they're a credit union, right? So they polled their staff and they said, what is, what is the biggest problems that you're having today? And the frontline staff and actually all the staff said that, um, and I'll use an example of a member walking into a branch and needing information. So they walk up to the teller and said, you know, I want to do some estate planning. Right. Um, can you answer some questions on estate planning for me? And, you know, that teller's going, sure. Uh, you know, they get the question, they don't know where to go, and that was their biggest complaint, is we get questions and we right. have no idea how to find a subject matter expert. So how we relate it to that is say, well, what about if this scenario happened? That that member walks into that branch, they go to, up to the teller, and they ask a the question about a state planner, the, the teller goes and they have a tool using the unified communications. They can go, they can have it broken up. Oh, there's the state planning group. Oh, there's three people that are available. I'm going to ping my question to that person. Um, I get the answer back and say, here's your answer. And if you'd like to delve a little deeper into that, we have these side rooms arranged over here. And we can do a video conference um, with that estate planner. And, you know, they can help you delve a little deeper into your estate planning or help you with your estate planning right now. Um, or we can set up an appointment. You know, that, that personal touch, do you think that member is going to walk to the bank across the street or the Royal Bank or these branches that give you the auto attendant from hell? I don't think so. Probably not. No, that sounds like a terrific application. So um, I, I guess also something that can happen when you start to work with customers is you can go in with some preconceived notions about what, you, what it is that you might be selling them. And then as you get a little deeper into the scenario, it turns out that that's not the direction you're going to head at all. Uh, I know you had uh, a, an opportunity that you closed uh, Wenzel Downhole Tools where uh, that actually occurred. Uh, so can you let us know where you started and where you ended up and how you got there? Sure. So we, uh, we went in, at your you know, your typical meeting, and their, the problem that they had was they have two offices, Edmonton, Calgary, and uh, VPN internet connectivity between the two. Um, it was a problem. They didn't have enough bandwidth. They couldn't transfer data back and forth. And these are oil field guys, not technology guys. Right. And, you know, I tried talking to him a little bit about, you know, SIP trunking and some of the cool things that they could do. And he's like, you know what, that's great. Let's put that aside and let's just deal with this internet problem we're having. So we need to boost up our internet in Edmonton. Right. And so we said, okay. So we sold him, a, you know, we stepped back a bit. We sold him an internet connection in Edmonton. Uh, and then we said, you know, can we do, you know, just do a phone audit for you and, you know, gather your phone bills and see where we're at and maybe we can save you some money on some of this other stuff. Right. They gave us the information. We did the, uh, we did the audit. And, uh, and it turned out that by rolling in the, uh, the PRIs that they had and the voice lines and all that into the equation, so rolling in SIP trunking, Secure Connect, and the MPLS, they only had to spend a couple hundred dollars more a month to get 
a much more robust solution and actually truly solve the problem between their Edmonton and Calgary offices. So we went back into another meeting and, uh, and presented our solution and said, look, this is what we really can recommend because just beefing up your internet access, it may solve your problem, but you can't do any QoS and the st stuff that you're doing. Look at what we have for you. Um, and by rolling it all together and for a couple hundred dollars more a month and on the spot he goes, yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. Send me the paperwork and let's move forward. So it turned it from an $800 deal to a $2,800 deal nice. um, by having that conversation and, you know, delving a little deeper and, you know, it wasn't necessarily what they were asking for, um, but by doing an overall solution, it, it got them more, more of what they were wanting and made them realize what they wanted really. Okay. So maybe let's just take a little different route here and, and look at a couple of other bases in the all-stream home run, that being UC and security. Uh, when do you introduce those into the conversation? So UC and security, for that matter, very early on into the conversation. Um, coming from that technical background myself and the UC background myself, yeah. it's probably where I'm most comfortable. But um, as I alluded to before, you know, it's a differentiator again, mm -hmm. right? You have to differentiate ourselves as much as we can. And UC is what enables a network. So you can have the best highway in the world, but if you don't have any cars to put on it, it doesn't really matter. So we, we have this amazing highway with all these great bolt-ons to it. Right. Um, we now give them the technology and the tools, you know, voicemail to, voicemail to email, mobility, um, you know, single number reach, fixed mobile convergence, you know, teleworkers, all these great things that, that, that technology can do. And the more technology they, they get, um, the more highways it, it drives. Great. So that's why UC has been a big, a big driver for me. Um, and security as well. So when we, when we go back to what, you know, I mentioned the firewalls and right. I'd come back to it later. One thing I bring up to, to the IT people that I'm talking to, and sometimes even the business people, that these firewalls, there are holes into the network, as I alluded to, and they have to be patched and maintained. So even if you have the great checkpoint firewalls and whatnot, there's constant patches. So why do we think there's patches? Sometimes they're for bugs, but a lot of times they're for vulnerability. Right. A hole's been detected in those firewalls, and they create a patch to fix that hole and patch that hole. So my question to them is, how often do you put those patches on your firewalls? And from the time that that hole is identified and the hackers are hacking into networks yeah. to it's patched to you patch all your routers how long does that take sometimes that can be a month sometimes it can be two months sometimes it can be three months six months a year and their their network is vulnerable for that whole time that, that patch isn't applied and there's businesses out there on the network that that's you know not legitimate businesses, but there's hackers out there that are going attacking businesses, trying to get their sensitive information, trying to get banking information, trying to get client information so they can exploit it. And, you know, if you do research online, it, you know, there's studies that show 80% of, of organizations that have, been, that have been hacked and lost sensitive um, individual data go out of business within a year. Right. So, you know, the question I throw back to them is saying, do you want to be a proactive organization or do you want to be a reactive organization? Wow. By deploying, you know, our SIP trunking or our, you know, our total solution, the Allstream Home Run, you're being proactive because, you know, we're going to make sure that, you know, your network is safe and we, we, we uh, plug all the holes. Yeah, the IPC revenue from these deals is great, but the UC um, opportunity is nothing to sneeze at either. I think one of the deals that we talked about a while ago was something like $160,000, uh, just on the UC piece. Can you uh, uh, give us a little bit of a flavor of how that worked? Yeah, so that's, that's Chando's construction. Right. And, uh, and that was, uh, I really like that story as well because, uh, you know, we sold them the MPLS first. They were a Shift Networks customer. So we sold them the MPLS network to solve their data issues that we were having. And then once that was in place and they loved how it did, um, they came back to us and said, okay, now we want to talk to you about our phones because they had that shift networks over the internet, wasn't working very well, had all these great features, um, but they didn't really want to go away from the paying per user kind of cost. Oh, okay. So with the Allstream Shield, um, which is a leasing, a really cool leasing solution that everybody should position, it, uh, we were able to break it down on a per user cost. 
So we took the $180,000 of the total solution, we got the monthly lease cost of like three grand a month, and we broke it down into their 150 users they had. Did the same thing with the MPLS, added in the SIP trunking for the, the trunking solution, and it ended up being less per user than they were paying for their shift networks. Um, and as they added users, it became a lot less expensive. So as soon as he saw that, you know, before he was tried to be sold thirty thousand, forty thousand dollar voice solutions, and he goes, "No, right. I don't want to spend thirty, forty grand." But breaking it up on the per user basis, he's like, "Yeah, this makes sense. Let's go." So, uh, so that that was really cool, and I really liked that uh, that ability. All right, Mike. We've uh, talked a lot about different deals that you've done, different opportunities. There's been a lot of uh, revenue generated. Do you have one that you've worked on of uh, of the deals you've closed that really would stick out as a favorite for you? Yeah, um, Maltese Geomatics, and uh, there's a few reasons why why it kind of stands out. One is it was uh, it was quite a challenge to win. Um, reason being is we sold them an MPLS network um, four years ago, and uh, and they've been up for renewal, so trying to renew them on a new contract, and we're going against Shaw. So the previous rep that sold the deal uh, moved on to Shaw and you know was trying to leverage the relationship he had when he sold it to say, hey, come over to us. I went over to Shaw because they're better. And uh, so you know it, <laughs> that was a little bit uh, difficult to, to manage, but you know, and they were also two thousand dollars less than us. Wow. All right. And uh, so it was, you know, what really got things going for me there is the fact that we started talking about, you know, we understand that, you know, these are the reasons why we want you to go there. You, the QoS on our network, there, you know, Shaw doesn't have direct QoS. They have to go around a different way to do it. And not even necessarily talking about what Shaw can or can't do, more so talking about the vision of where we see them going right. and how it's a partnership. And so I was in the, you know, presenting the pricing and I was in with the IT guy and, and you know, we had our little drawing going on the, on the diagram and said, you know, this is where we're positioning you today and you have your MPLS. We're adding the Secure Connect for the Internet Gateway. Um, we also want to... Uh, we also want to look at SIP trunking and the reason why we want to do SIP trunking is I understand you're in contracts with your PRIs today but we want to get you here and I explained what SIP trunking could do and the flexible flail over and all that kind of stuff and you know he had that smile on his face and he said I, I really like this let me go grab one of the executives right let me go grab let me go grab Bob so he go grabs Bob and he goes, okay, tell me, you know, he goes, Bob, I'm going to tell you a little bit first. And then he goes, actually, you know what, Mike, you know, you tell Bob. And uh, I went through it again and, uh, and he's like, well, actually, your timing couldn't be better because there's, there's a way that's turned up that we can get out of our contracts and our PRIs with TELUS. Wow. And, uh, and then they said, you know what, we like what you have to say. We want you, you know, we want to move forward. And, uh, and, and that happened. That was a couple of days after you know, after their initial conversation. But uh, not only did they move forward, they spent probably 2500 to three grand more than Shaw um, because of the fact that, once again, that differentiation and all the things, the total solution of what we could provide. You know, so it turned the MPLS renewal into an $1,800 uplift and a $6,800 $6, a month uh, renewal. All right, well, I mean... That sounds great, and I'm sure that you know when customers look at these proposals, they look at them and go, "Yeah, you know, we could save some money. There's some additional things we can do." But when it really comes time to make a decision, um, oftentimes customers will balk at making one because they're uncertain about the technology, they're uncertain about Allstream as a company, they may not know us well, and of course the other thing is when somebody flips that switch on cutover day. You know, is everything that I'm going to want to see there going to be there? So how do you deal with that kind of uh, trepidation that our customers may yeah. actually have? Yeah, that's, uh, that's definitely a very common problem. Um, and and it, I think it's important to identify how flexible Allstream is and that we understand that. We understand the technology. Right. We understand that this can potentially be a difficult transition for customers and that they're busy doing what they do so that we have flexible options. We can create uh, you know, a, a, an alternate network that everything can be tested, and then when everything is tested to their satisfaction, you know, we just point the new traffic to this new network and away we go. You know, or we can create it where we mirror the networks. So we have the two routers in place, they unplug their old, plug in the new, everything matches and just starts working. 
Um, you know, we have our interoperability testing, right. which can be used to, you know, it's for SIP trunking, and it's used to test, uh, make sure the caller ID and all these call patterns that the customers expected occur. And that can be used as a positive spin to say, look, we go through this, in, you know, extensive testing process, so you get a clear understanding of what we're providing, and you have that confidence to know that we're doing the steps necessary to make sure that it's going to work. All right, so that's very important. Um, and, you know, if, if the customers agreed to that interoperability testing, that's probably a pretty good signal that they're ready to go on the deal, too, because there is some investment of time on their part of that, at that stage of the game, right? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Because they have to commit to, you know, having a resource to do the test, or maybe they have our UC group that does a test. But that's definitely a key sign that, you know, they, they like what you have to say for sure. Um, and, though, you know, another common rejection or, or potential roadblock that I see is, uh, you know, oh, even though it can save us money and you guys have all these great things, it's, you know, we're so busy, we don't have the time to dedicate the internal resources and, you know, and, and that's, you know, I, again, I just say that we're flexible, we, we understand that and we minimize the impact on your organization as much as possible. And then I bring, you know, that's where hopefully all the conversations that we've had along and all the value and how the tools that that we say that we're going to bring to them and enable their organization, um, that becomes a fairly easy obstacle to overcome. Right. Well, they'll find out there's certainly opportunities to save time by going with us so they can focus on their core business instead. You know, that brings up another, another really good point that, you know, a lot of customers don't look at. The use of technology can save you 5, 10, 15, 20 minutes per employee per day. And what impact does that have on the overall effectiveness of the organization, right? How much more can that bring to your bottom line? Now, while those are soft costs, it's a definite reality. Mm -hmm. It's very easy to save on the, you know, 10, 20 minutes a day using technology, for sure. Um, in terms of some of the other objections you get, maybe you can discuss some of those a bit. I know one that, you know, VoIP still has kind of a bad reputation. Probably it's undeserved now. But is that something you encounter as well? Oh, yeah. That's probably the most common one, actually. Um, people, you know, they hear that they get the VoIP phones Vonage at home and right. and all these things, and they know that the, the dropped calls and the static and all the other stuff that goes along with crappy qual quality um, goes back again to what I said earlier about being over the Internet and the fact that those the, the all those problems occur because of the fact that there's no QoS on the internet. Right. You get people that are doing denial of service attacks or they might be, you know, all the kids after school might be downloading movies or, you know, other things that maybe they shouldn't be. Um, you know, so, so it's the internet we have no control. Right. Whereas, you know, I identify to the customers that, you know, we do this every day and we ensure that we have control. We deploy quality of service over the networks. We, if they don't have the ability to test it on their own internal network, we enable them. We can provide that service to test their networks to make sure that they're ready for the voice over IP. And also the fact that, you know, it's here, it's not that if we go to voice over IP, it's a matter of when. It, right. it's, it's definitely every organization is going to have voice over IP in the very near future. Um, it's just a way of life. You know, don't get a manufacturer that isn't designing voice over IP technology. So uh, it's definitely a wave. Um, another key objection, uh, you know, actually near the end I don't get a whole lot of objections because it's important to handle them all along the whole sales process. Right. Never be afraid if you see something that could be a potential objection, you know, encounter it head on, right? Um, don't shy away from it because every obstacle that you overcome gets you one step closer than putting ink on that paper. Okay, so that's a, a good segue into my next question is putting the ink on the paper is obviously the most important part now. Yeah. So um, how do you get that pen out of their pocket and onto the contract? <laughs> it's, uh, it's typically when you get to that point because we've positioned you know, such a great solution uh, you know when you're there, the customer knows when they're there, and there's no longer any objections. It's, it's just, you know, when would you like me to send, uh, send the paperwork? Um, you know, can I send you the contracts? You know, those, those sorts of things. Typically, the objections are all handled. If you have objections when you're at the paperwork signing process, um, probably should have been dealt with earlier on. Okay, so if you're a sales rep now, you've listened to Mike uh, Schoenberger talk today, and you've gone out, found an opportunity, and closed the deal, got the contract signed, 
the next thing that's going to happen is the daunting task of getting the deal implemented. And uh, I was wondering if you could sort of comment on how implementations have gone on your opportunities and just sort of the implementation of SIP trunking in general. So uh, if we were to have this conversation a year or two years ago, um, it would have been a completely different conversation. And I probably would have had a lot more hair back then. <laughs> um, it's, uh, it's definitely improved a lot. And, uh, you know, as I alluded to earlier, a lot of times when you have challenges, if you embrace those challenges um, and overcome them and create new policies and procedures in place, then, you know, we can do great things. And, and we've done that. And uh, the organization has added a whole bunch of resources towards SIP trunking. Uh, they've got, I can't remember the exact number of bodies, like eight towards the end of this year. Great. Uh, ability to do SIP trunking over MPLS, so customers that have existing MPLS. And they're looking at other ideas to make it easier and easier to sell SIP and then install SIP. So um, with the ability to do the QoS over the internet next year, that's another cool thing. Um, so when we're talking installations, Creative Door that I alluded to earlier, yeah. it was 12 week time frame. So from contract signing to installation, brand new building, location that's a head office, brand new construction, fiber build to it, it's potential for disaster and while there was ch ch challenges getting the service into there, right. the IP trunking part of it, SIP trunking part of it was smooth as silk. It was no different than a PRI. It was, you know, did the testing, hooked it up, tested a couple of lines, works brilliant, cut it over, done. You know, I, it, there's not really a lot to comment other, on it other than it went beautifully. So where we were that it was extremely painful to where we are today is night and day. And, uh, you know, I can say with confidence selling SIP trunking um, is never easier than it has been today, for sure. That's great. It sounds, uh, th there's also a program in place now that will even further accelerate the, these uh, installations, is there not? Yeah, it's the, the RAP program. Oh, okay. And uh, I've got three projects that are going through this program right now. And, uh, you know, yeah, they're all proceeding nicely. Uh, one of the problems that we had before, as probably everybody is aware of, is that one, we put an order in as a sales rep and it touches like 10 hands, 15 hands before it gets actually to completion. And uh, a lot of times things got lost in translations and messed up. And so now they've got a process in place that, you know, one person puts the order in and they have this group that sees the order through the process and they're able to shave a lot of time over off that installation process and get that, you know, get that revenue, which helps us all out uh, sooner rather than later. Oh, well, that's great. When so a customer great. makes that decision to buy, they're certainly going to be excited to get it installed as quickly as possible. So yeah. that's good news. Um, all right, you, you've obviously got a very strong technical background, certainly on the UC, uh, C side, and that's translated very well into the rest of the services that Allstream sells. Not all of our uh, sales team have the same uh, training and experience that you do. So I wanted to ask you for those that uh, need to engage uh, SEs and technical resources to help research and develop the solutions, what's some of the critical information they should be looking for before they engage those valuable technical resources? So, you know, as I alluded to earlier, you really want to understand the landscape of the customer. So, you know, is it of the correct size? Does it kind of fit that basic criteria? Do they have multiple locations that are in areas that are in those, you know, the Torontos, the Edmonton, the Calgary's that have the ability to provide service at on net uh, or co-locate facilities? Um, you know, understanding that before they go to their first meeting and then validating validating that with the customer, trying to find a little bit of those business needs potentially that that uh, can, you know, offer insight that, yeah, there's a great opportunity here. Um, make a note of the UC system in place. Right. You know, write down what it is. You know, you can even say, hey, you know, just, you mind if I just write this number down? And, sure. And, you know, because it really it doesn't matter what it is. Um, if it's an old system, if it's a new system, if it's a new system, great. They can leverage maybe some of the technology that they don't know that they have. If it's an older system, it's an opportunity for, uh, for an upgrade and, and potentially leverage another wedge into some of the other stuff that we do. Um, try the telephone bill audit, right? Uh, that's, that's, uh, that's definitely a big thing is, uh, you know, that can uncover all kinds of opportunities. Right. Um, Another key thing is is forming partnerships. I think is 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 really key in 
not only understanding the landscape, but what I do, what I mean by that is I take, I picked IT groups. So IT consulting companies that go into businesses and make sure that their networks, you know, work for them. Right. I, I form, you know, when I'm meeting with customers and I find that they outsource their IT, I take the time to meet that IT person, take them out for lunch and find synergies and say, how can we help each other? And get them to be on your side, whether we sign them up for our, um, you know, lead generation program where they actually get paid if they bring us in for leads or they get the added benefit of helping to implement the solution that we're pro proposing to their customer and that's worked extremely well for me because they open that door for me they open that crack and it's a qualified you know there i'm coming in already as a trusted advisor like hey you guys need to do that i've got a guy for you that can really help you out and he's helped out a lot of our other clients yeah. um, that just gets the customer opening up so it's very important to form those sorts of alliances where you can of people that'll bring you in and introduce you to the clients. Okay, great. All right, here's an opportunity for you to provide us with sort of some final sage advice before we close today. So take it away. All okay. right. So, uh, you know, never think that, that SIP trunking does not apply. Uh, it should be brought up and it can uncover, you know, opportunities in, in unexpected places. It's, it's a wedge, right? Um, position multiple products. The, the more products that, that you bring in, you know, when I look at UC, it has some cool stuff that it can do. When I look at MPLS, it's got some cool features, SIP trunking cool features. Any one of them are cool, and they do neat things. Um, everybody is saying how cool their stuff is. But when you leverage it all together and you right. incorporate it into one total solution, um, it has the value increases tenfold, and it, 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 it differentiates us because we can put it together and we can deliver on it. Right, so that's that's definitely very very key. Um, you know, another thing is that we're extremely focused as an organization. We only deal with businesses, so we're we're focused on business. Our competitors are Telus, our Bell, our Shaw. They've got their residential side of the business, and and so their focus is kind of a little bit all over the place. Where we're, you know, our MPLS is our is our bread and butter, and all our bolt-ons are. Uh, are what brings you know us the sales reps the the, the bread and our bread and butter. Um, the last thing that I want to bring is uh, to customer testimonials, case studies, right. and the importance of them. Uh, you know that that Uniglobe travel that I was talking about that was the very very painful installation. It was new. It was you know biweekly conference calls, escalations, all kinds of really crazy fun stuff. Right. But we stuck to it, and uh, you know. I was involved towards the tail end, luckily, um, but I was able to clean up all the pieces. But now that, that customer is, uh, is a case study reference for us. They've done a white paper that says how great Allstream is and how great the Allstream solution is working for them. So from one that was extremely unhappy and frustrated to a customer that's extremely happy, that's a great, a great success story to share. And, you know, so that brings up two things, is the more of these case studies we can ask for, right. I go into every deal that I'm positioning and saying, you know what, at the, you know, at the contract signing or even during the sales process, is my goal is for you to be a case study. I want you to write and tell how Allstream helped your business and how much you love us. I want you to be able to write about that, and I'm going to ask you to do that for us. So I plant that seed early on. And so they have that expectation that we want to achieve greatness right off the block, even when we're, we're positioning it. So it can be important there. And then the more case studies we get, I don't have to, you don't have to have these reference requests that go around all the time. I know I get hassled all the time for that, as I'm sure all the sales reps do. You have this, this database of references that you can go to and provide to customers that, hey, here's a customer that's in a like industry. Right. Um, they have what I have, and look what Allstream did for them. Yep. I hope they can do that for me. So those case studies are really important. Okay. Before I let you go today and before we summarize uh, our conversation, it reminds me of uh, a really valuable tip that you passed along to me the other day about the importance of summarizing the call with the customer. So maybe you can end with that tip for us. Sure. So when I'm in, in a meeting with a customer, um, this has worked very well, is I summarize all the, uh, the action items and, and try to put deliverables to them for myself and the client. So um, throughout the meeting, uh, you know, it, it, if there's points, if there's things that we've uncovered, data we've uncovered, um, 
write it down, summarize it at the end, and then say, you know, we discussed this, we discussed this, we discussed this, this is what my takeaway on that is, uh, and then you would discuss that you would be able to get me this, you know, these phone bills, uh, can we set up a follow-up follow date and time where, you know, that you can have this information to me, or how quickly can you have the information to me, is it okay if I follow up with you at that time? Um, these are all things that that are very important because it gives you a thermometer of you know how have you done in the meeting right. um, because when you give the customer action items it, it's twofold really it lets them know that you heard them that you can verbalize back what their business issues are right. what your takeaways are and how you can actually help their organization and it gives them something that they have to come back to you with and if they don't and you follow up and they don't you probably no need to waste your time pursuing that opportunity. Right. But if they get back to you quickly, you've got a, a hot a hot customer, one that's you know ready to move forward or you know really excited about what you have to say at least, and it's something that you can action quicker. So it, it gives you that gauge on on the uh, how well you did in your meeting. Okay, that's great. From what we've learned today, SIP trunking represents a significant opportunity for us to set ourselves apart from the competition. Not only do we provide the most logical progression from expensive legacy telco services to deliver cost savings, we also enable operating efficiencies by converging customers' existing infrastructure and leveraging SIP trunking as a strategic business tool. So once again, Mike, thanks so much for sharing all your experiences and insights with us today. And I'd like to wish all of you the very best luck in positioning SIP trunking with your prospects and your customers, and hitting the all-stream home run.